So the problem that I'll be uh, presenting on is is the idea of uh, identifying trade-offs and giving a, a reasonable balance to trade-offs when um, managers of conservation areas, but also outside of conservation areas, are faced um, faced with decisions. We need to uh, you know give a better idea of trade-offs and equal balance to both economic and traditionally non-economic um, benefits within that sort of trade-off. We've heard about ecosystem services and they vary and some of them are, are more or less um, amenable to the idea of an economic valuation. And biodiversity, I think m most people would agree, is probably on the more difficult end of that scale. So we're talking about um, the identification of co-benefits such as carbon sequestration, water regulation, making these clear that can provide the impetus um, for um, protected area management to take into consideration these areas, uh, if not for their um, sort of biodiversity values that are, are difficult to monetize, um, then for perhaps the co-benefits that also come out of these areas. The field of ecosystem services, uh, identification and valuation is not a particularly new one. There's been people working on this for a long time, like, like Valerie was saying before. Um, what is new is having a framework where we can standardise the, the concepts and standardise the measures. We get a, um, even just a standard language so we all know that we're talking about the same things. So this is grounded in the system of national accounts, um, which I'm sure a, a lot of you are familiar with. It's been around for a very long time and has uh, evolved in an iterative process um, and is at the level of an international statistical standard, just as the CS Central Framework is. So if this ecosystem accounting framework is uh, a very comprehensive suite of accounts that we can produce. Um, I don't think many people have had a go at trying to produce all of these accounts, like a, a full sequence, just as the system of national accounts. Um, and I think that producing any one of these is an endeavour that's going to bring a lot of benefit in itself, but the more that we can add on and you know, push to bring on more and more accounts, we give better clarity to those trade-offs that we're trying to inform. So we have an ecosystem condition account, and this tells us um, what, our, what our assets, say for example, a protected area, is it in good condition? And, and what's that in reference to? Is that in reference to what it used to be like, you know, perhaps before um, there was some human impact? or are we measuring that condition against what we would like it to be like? Um, and so there we can talk about uh, different measures or, or indexes, um, such as, as we saw before, with um, sort of pinning our, our condition that we're aiming for at 100 and then measuring against that score over time. We have an ecosystem production account, which is the ecosystem services that we've been talking about. Um, and so there we can talk about, um, say, perhaps the amount of timber that's being produced, the amount of water that's being filtered, or the mass that's being stabilised um, through uh, the, the presence of different ecosystems. That can be measured in, in both volumes, so we can talk about the tons or the, the litres, but we can also have a go at monetizing that. So we can say that the eco ecosystem is producing, contributing to a benefit of X dollars that is being realised in society. Our ecosystem asset account tells us how much of that ecosystem we've got left. Is, is uh, part of our ecosystem being converted to another land type? Um, and also, uh, how is that affecting the capacity to generate these production account services that we're also measuring? So we can say how much we've got and also what's the capacity to then uh, bring these services into our society. Have a biodiversity account. Um, which tells us what is the, the makeup of the biodiversity that we've got in those areas. Um, we're there we're really talking about the, the species diversity. And then finally, so the supply use account, um, which is a really, um, really comprehensive and sort of an extension upon most of the other accounts. And that's really linking the suppliers and users of ecosystem services. And when you're spatially, def when you're defining your area to a sometimes very small spatial area, the beneficiaries of those um, services, especially with carbon sequestration, mass stabilisation, water filtration, 
they can be very difficult to to identify and then also very difficult to locate if we're trying to map those beneficiaries. So here we have some example of of work that was done in a, in a province of the Netherlands, in Limburg. And so this gives us a good um, illustration of the power of these maps. Um, so it's difficult to see, but from left to right we have crop production, fodder production, air quality regulation, carbon sequestration, and then finally cycling recreation. And so this is um, a spatial view of different areas, different parts of this province, and their ability to produce these ecosystem services. We can see that even within a province, which isn't a particularly large uh, area, especially compared to somewhere like a natural resource management region in, in Australia, um, there's huge variability in, in, the, um, in the ecosystem's uh, ability to produce these services. And we can also see, perhaps most importantly, that some of these benefits um, are derived especially in different areas. So we can see uh, air quality regulation and carbon sequestration, unsurprisingly. If we overlap those two layers, there's a, um, you know, they really line up well and the same areas are important for both. And here's an, another piece of work that's been done in Telemark County in Norway. And this is a good example of the, um, I guess, the limiting scope of some of these ecosystem accounts. So generally the first step is we go in and we start off by saying what are the policy issues and what do we need to focus our account on because it would take forever and we'd spend our whole lives I think um, researching different ways to measure and value services if we go in and say we want to know the total value of absolutely everything that we derive from this area. So in this instance um, the team has gone in and the policy issues centred around uh, moose hunting, which is on the left, sheep grazing, and then timber harvest. So we've really just got three services or three areas that we're interested in. We've limited ourselves to that. Um, we start off with a land cover uh, map up the top, and then from there we can use various modelling techniques to derive the capacity of these areas of our asset to produce those services. And once again, you can see they vary differently within our area. And some of them overlap really well, so I'm talking especially about the lower right sort of corner. We can see it's important for each of those areas. Uh, and this is the sort of stuff that can inform not just on a sort of a macro level, but we can say to land managers, you know, these pockets of land are the ones that perhaps, if these are the three issues you're concerned about, these are the ones where investment might be most justified in, in conservation. So this is work in progress and, and there's little correlation between species here, but I think we can probably see that if we then overlay those maps which uh, you know, tell us about the species richness of birds and butterflies and dragonflies, and we can do that for various other species as well. If we compare those and overlay those with, with these maps, and these are the ones that we can value, we start to get a really powerful tool and we can say these are the areas, again, that are possibly the best ones for some intervention and for some investment in protection. Okay, so some of the conclusions um, from this presentation, and I think it's an important point to make, you know, overall, is that ecosystem accounting is feasible and, and also in data poor environments. Um, I think sometimes too much data is, is actually not a good thing. That sorting out that we just were talking about in Palawan, the sorting through data can take just an especially long time, um, especially when a lot of the data is not particularly in a long time series or at a different spatial scale to what we're after. Um, so it, it certainly is feasible, especially if, if you're willing to and you have the capacity to do some modelling, uh, you can make these accounts a reality. I think narrowing that scope and identifying the policy issues in the beginning is the most important thing to producing something that's going to be useful in the outcome. Um, critical is long-term commitment um, and, and it's a new field so we need to allow these accounts to grow and they become more powerful over time.